Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Is the government right in claiming that the quarter three economic results suggest that the economy is recovering swiftly and satisfactorily? Or are there problems with the way the Indian government calculates GDP growth, which could suggest that actually it's misleading? That's the key issue I should pursue today with the chief emerging markets economist of America's JP Morgan Bank, who joins us from New York, Jahangir Aziz. Dr. Aziz, perhaps I should start by forewarning the audience that at least to begin with, our discussion will be somewhat technical and therefore difficult to follow unless they concentrate fairly closely. Now, in an article that you recently wrote for the Indian Express, you pointed out that because the Indian government measures growth year on year rather than quarter on quarter, the mm -hmm. truth is we end up having a very good idea of how growth compares to a year before, but we do not have a clear idea of how growth compares to just three months or four months before. And this you say is misleading because we don't know as a result whether the economy is accelerating or whether it's slowing down. So can you start yeah. by explaining why is it misleading? So let me start with the analogy, uh, Mr. Tapper. Uh, so the analogy is that suppose you are driving a car, right? And the car is exactly the same as any other car, except one difference, the speedometer. So instead of the speedometer actually telling you what is the current speed, the speedometer tells you what is the speed, let's say, four hours back. So apart from the, you know, the funny incidents that will happen trying to explain what is your speed when you're caught for traffic violation and, you know, concerns about, you know, how do you even define speed limit? There's a much more fundamental problem. And the fundamental problem is that you as a driver, Mr. Tapper, you wouldn't know whether you are accelerating or the car is decelerating. And if you don't know whether the car is accelerating or decelerating, then you wouldn't know whether to press the accelerator or to press the brake. Now replace the car with the economy, the speed of the car with the growth rate of the economy, an acceleration providing stimulus to the economy and, this, and putting the foot on the brake as taking away stimulus. The problem is that if you don't know the current speed, then you wouldn't know whether or not to add to stimulus, add more policy support uh, to the economy or to withdraw policy support. I think that's the quandary that uh, not knowing what the current speed of the economy is runs into, that it provides a very bad narrative in fact, a misleading narrative on which policies are now being based. And I don't want to blame the policymakers per se, uh, but the fact that we have this very antiquated system means that we are essentially getting misled by what is, what is being shown by the CSO in terms of the growth rates of the economy. Uh, one quick question. Does the majority of the world calculate growth quarter on quarter? And are we therefore just one of a minority who do it year on year? So if you go back to history, you know, statisticians knew about this problem and they've been working on it almost over 100 years. Uh, for the last 20 years, almost, not almost, every developed market economy publishes growth only on quarter and quarter. So when we say the US economy fell by, th by, by 33%, we actually mean quarter and quarter. We do not mean year over year. And I would say among the emerging market countries, almost all of the large emerging market countries, you know, the Brazils and the Chinas of the world, all of them publish data on a quarter and quarter because that's the right way to measure the speed of the economy, not what has happened four quarters ago or a year back. All right. That makes it clear. India is not part of the majority. We're very much part of the minority. Now, calculated on a year on year basis, the government says that in quarter three, the economy grew by 0.4%. Your bank, JP right. Morgan, has, however, done a calculation for quarter three on a quarter to quarter basis. And you've mm -hmm. discovered that, in fact, in quarter three, the economy grew by 5.7%. That's a huge right. difference of over 5%. Does it therefore follow that because of the way the government calculates growth, it doesn't fully appreciate how well the economy did in quarter three. Uh, absolutely. I think that uh, the narrative 
that most you know people are looking at for the case of india is that india's growth fell very bad was very badly hit in the first quarter uh, of the fiscal year you know it fell by minus 23 24% and then in the second quarter it grew it also fell by about 6 7.5% and finally we are seeing you know some light at the end of the tunnel with a positive growth of 0.4 0.5% but if but those are growth rates compared to what happened in those three quarters the year before you have to know what happened the year before to figure out what does it mean to have fallen by 23% so if you convert that into actual quarter and quarter growth so if i look at the first quarter of this year Uh, of 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 this fiscal year compared to the fourth quarter of the last fiscal year it is it, the growth rate actually fell by 25% so india collapsed by 25% in the second quarter of this fiscal year when the cso uh, put out a number which was minus 7 and a half compared to what happened in the second quarter of the previous fiscal year on a quarter quarterly basis india actually in the second quarter grew by an astonishing 21% that by the way was the highest recovery rate in the world but so was minus 25% one of the worst uh, in, in among among in the world and that pace of recovery which was 21% in the second quarter slowed down to 5.5% so if you look at the current speed of the economy and measured by the current speed of the economy the economy did obviously miserably in the first quarter it fell by 25% but it grew by an astonishing 21% and that pace is going to as slow down to about 5.5%. It is not that India has recovered now. India recovered one quarter before. But the interesting thing is when you look at economic growth calculated quarter to quarter as opposed to year yes. on year, you actually yes. discover that the Indian economy not only fell very badly but then recovered very well and in fact as you said Absolutely. that 22 23% recovery was the best recovery anywhere in the world that's a point clearly our government is not aware of because if they had been they would have rammed it home to us on this the government has been silent now let me bring up another example because when we look at quarter 3 you discover that the government's way of calculating growth actually is not giving a correct picture of the speed right. with which the economy is recovering but now when That's you look right. at the government's projections for the next fiscal year in the budget you end up with a somewhat different picture the budget yes. projects growth of 11% calculated year on year assuming that in fact inflation will be 3.5% and you have mm-hmm. calculated that this means an implied average quarterly pace of 1% that's a lot lower than the 5.7% in quarter 3 and what that means is over the next fiscal year 21 22 actually mm-hmm. the economy will be slowing down possibly quite appreciably right so you know i'm just looking at what the government's uh, i mean the government hasn't said anything about you know what it expects to happen in 21 22 i'm just going by the budget documents and the budget documents implied growth rate is that in the fiscal year in the coming fiscal year india is going to grow by about 11% if i take that year on that 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 annual growth number 11% then if if you compare it to what is going to be the annual growth rate in 21 in 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 this current fiscal year then the pace at which the economy has to grow every quarter to make it to 11% is just 1% per quarter which means that the 5.5% current speed that we have in this economy at this point has to go down to 1% in order to make it to the government's own projection so this is not my projection this is not my expectations is just the government's expectation that there is a severe slowdown implied in the government's own numbers Absolutely. That I'm not even sure sure that the government is aware of. Well, that would be very interesting because the two points we're making is that this is not an opinion. This is a straight fact derived from the mathematics yes. of the government's own fingers. Figures. Yes. And secondly, yeah. it seems as if the government is itself not aware of it. And this outcome or this conclusion is supported by separate calculations J.P. Morgan has itself done. J.P. Morgan. Right. 
believes that in fact yeah. the economy over the next fiscal year 21-22 will grow by 13.5 percent you've calculated that that amounts to a 1.6 percent per quarter growth on average that's and again, correct 1.6 is hugely less than the 5.7 achieved in quarter three so whether one bases oneself on the government's figures or whether one bases right. oneself on jp morgan's figures either way yeah the implied quarterly average growth is a lot less than the 5.7 achieved in quarter three. And therefore, no matter which route you take, the economy clearly looks as if it's going to be slowing down over the next fiscal. But you wouldn't know it. You wouldn't know it because the CSO will continue to produce numbers which are going to be on a year and year basis. On a year and year basis because this fiscal year was so bad. Even if you did nothing, you would be able to deliver an 8% growth rate in 2000 and in the next coming fiscal year. So I think the narrative will still be on a year on year basis numbers. We look at it and say, well, the economy is improving. In reality, the incomes that you receive or incomes the average Indian receive is going to grow at a very glacial pace, even by our, our own accounts, which is faster than that of the economy of one and a half. 1%. And yes, there is going to be a significant slowdown in the pace at which the economy is recovering. Uh, whether you look at our numbers, which are better than the government's or the government's number. Let me put it like this. What you're saying is that because the government calculates growth year on year, not quarter on quarter, right through the next fiscal year, 2021, 2022, the government will keep claiming or believing that the economy is accelerating. That's correct. Whereas the reality is quarter by quarter, it is slowing down. So because we rely on year on year, we have the mistaken belief we're doing well. Whereas if you look at it quarter on quarter, the reality is we're slowing down, we're decelerating. That's exactly right. And what really matters is what happens to your pocketbook. Right, in your, when, but the incomes that you receive, the increase that will take place in employment opportunities, all of that, they don't, they're not based on what happens on a year basis. They are based on what happened last, last quarter. So I think it will feel, it will not feel as if the India is recovering at a faster pace. It will feel that India is recovering, but it's covering at a much slower pace. So I think there will be a disconnect between the numbers and what will be the ground reality. And this is why the way India calculates GDP growth is misleading. It creates yes. a false impression that we are doing considerably better than the actual reality suggests. Now, you make a second point in that Indian Express article. Let me come to that. You say the reasons behind the deceleration are that India's growth drivers had already slowed down before the pandemic began. And then, that, yes, and then that slowdown was exacerbated by the pandemic. Let me first ask you, which are the growth drivers you are particularly worried about? So the two of them that we, we sort of, you know, find it very difficult to see how that is to turn around. So if you go back to the before the pre-pandemic, one, the big narrative was that there was a Lot of lot of headwinds created in the financial sector because of the uh, non-performance loans, because of the problems of bank capitalization. We tried to solve it, and we tried to solve it the right way uh, by putting together a bankruptcy code, and that all of that got stalled because of the pandemic. The bankruptcy code has is as not working has been temporarily paused. And consequently, the whatever progress we made, even though it was very modest, even that got stalled, such that in the pandemic, all of these non-performing loans most likely probably worsened. So the legacy with which India enters the pandemic, that those legacy problems most likely got worsened. On top of that, I think the, the one worry that you know we've been looking at, not just in India, but globally, is that, you know. We have been riding the coattails of globalization for a very long time. Uh, exports. Exports had completely languished. In the case of India, that's a major hit to India's growth prospects. And in the pandemic, India did not participate in the recovery that takes place in, in global growth, in global trade, which China does. So I think in terms of the legacy problems, two of them 
we are very worried about. One is what happened to the non-performing loans and the bad debt prior to the pandemic? Did they get worsened? And what's happened to India's really the major drivers of the Indian economy, which is external demand? Now you say that as a result of India's growth drivers slowing down, industry may have recovered to 90% yes. or 98% rather of its pre-pandemic mm -hmm. levels, but the services sector remains substantially below. And because the services yes. sector amounts to something like 55% of the Indian economy, this slowing That's down correct. of the services sector means the economy as a whole is slowing down and unemployment, which is what matters to ordinary people, gets badly affected. Am I right in those two points? That's exactly right. And this is not, again, not, nothing, not, not just an India phenomenon. It's a phenomenon across the world. If you, re if you remember the nature of the pandemic. The nature of the pandemic was that the way we tackled pandemic in India and elsewhere was to have lockdowns, travel restrictions, restrictions on communicating with one another. And that didn't affect manufacturing as much as it affected services sector, where person to person contact is essential. And consequently, the services industry globally and in India is the one that was disproportionately affected, not manufacturing. Across the world, manufacturing has been doing much better. India, it has been doing better. But as you rightly pointed out, services is where the bulk of employment is. Service is not just where the bulk of employment is. Service is also a place which disproportionately also employs a large number of women. So what we end up having large service sector unemployment is that we are not only increasing the overall level of employment, we are also widening the gender gap. And I, and I think that these kinds of fissures, where the gender gap widens, actually comes, will come to haunt us if we don't correct it. Now you say, and I'm quoting from that Indian Express article, neither fiscal policy nor monetary policy right. are designed to reverse these widening economic imbalances. And there are, uh, your conclusion is, this makes it hard to see how India's growth engines can fire on all cylinders despite the rollout of the vaccines and the anticipated surge in US growth. That's not good news for India, is it? No, it isn't. And if I look at fiscal policy, for example, the budget that was just done, you know, uh, uh, a month back, and we, we had a panel on that, we discussed about it. The highlight of the budget is that in the Indian government is going to push infrastructure uh, spending, but it's just 0.2% of GDP, and there will be a lot of privatization. That doesn't address these imbalances. That doesn't address the unemployment, the scarring of unemployment. The, that doesn't address the gender gap, the inequality increases. And I know that we as macroeconomists don't pay much attention to it because we think that doesn't matter. But as the world over the last 10 years have shown, those are very, those are extremely important in shaping the future of a country's economy. And I could add that that although the government hopes its push on infrastructure will create jobs, there is always a six, seven month lag before infrastructure yes. happens. And that six, seven month lag means that unemployment will not be tackled for a very long time. And that adds to people's hunger. It adds to their homelessness. And it adds to the fact that they have debts that they can't pay. So the problem I can ex exacerbate. And I think that's the last bit that you spoke about, which is probably the far more problematic. The last bit is that, you know, people have been re reducing their savings, not just households, but also SMEs have been reducing their savings, eating into their, eating into their savings, you know, to survive for the last 18 months or so. And I think that we are underestimating how much that is going to become a headwind when you know mobility normalizes because that's the point in time when all of these people are going to go run to the banks to get uh, credit in order for them to uh, restart their businesses for example and that's the point the banks will say well you don't have the net worth you don't have the collateral to provide you with the credit and if that credit doesn't come through then even our 1.5%, which is you know, the most optimistic in the market, even that has very large downside risks. In which case, what is it that the government should do to tackle the problem that you've so correctly seen, 
and which it seems the government is either not willing to see or not able to see. What is it that they should do? Or is it that there isn't very much they can do? No, I mean, there is clearly government can do a lot. And it isn't something that, that you know, I'm saying something that is absolutely new or out of the box. Most countries in the world are exactly following that, which is that they need to provide income support. I know that in India, income support is seen as a bad word. You know, you're throwing out dole, you're throwing out a crush to the people. Instead, you should be giving them jobs and you should give them employment. Most of the time, the argument is correct. This is a time when you need to provide income support, not because you're throwing out a dole, but you want to preserve their net worth. You want to make sure that these people do not come in, go into a recovery with, uh, with their balance sheets completely impaired. And if you look at the US, you look at Brazil, all of these countries have provided massive amounts of uh, income support. The entire 1.9 trillion that the US has provided just last week, all entire amount was just income support in various forms. Absolutely. In contrast to the US, whatever income support was provided, and it wasn't, I should add, very much, terminated no. around November, December. We were That's hoping correct. that there would be a fresh burst of income support with the budget. And really and truly, there hasn't been. So although there are things the government can do, income support in particular, it's not doing it. So then let me put this to you. Doesn't it therefore mean that the future does not look anywhere near as rosy as the government wants us to believe? I mean, again, you know, I would say that the narrative, just because I'm saying that you should go to a quarter and quarter growth rate, that doesn't mean the narrative is going to change. The narrative will still remain based on these year and year numbers. On the year and year numbers, that narrative will show that things are getting better, things are improving. Uh, in fact, they will probably improve even stronger than the government's 11%. But the reality is that you're not going to feel it because what you will feel is a very, very glacial pace of recovery. Absolutely. Because the government relies on here on your figures, the government and those figures will keep showing that actually we're growing at 8, 9, 10, 11%. And that will be right. cheerful news. But the reality, which is very different will be that actually the economy is slowing down. But we won't know that reality in actual terms because we don't go back quarter to quarter figures. We'll be misled by the year on year calculations and we will only be aware of the reality because we will say to ourselves, hang on, for an economy growing at 8, 9, 10%, it doesn't quite feel like that on the ground. And that's because we're not looking at quarter to quarter figures which actually show that on the ground, we're not growing at 8, 9, 10%. We're slowing down appreciably. And that's the thing. The government will get away with it because of the way we present growth in year-on-year -year terms. But the reality will be that in actual quarter-to-quarter -quarter terms, we're slowing down. And when I say the future won't be as rosy as the government claims, what I'm saying is the reality will not be as rosy as the presentation or the claim. No, I mean, uh, that, that, that is not just a problem of, you know, the government is basing itself on a set, a, a growth narrative which doesn't exist. I think not, it is not just the government, it is going to be the RBI. Both of them will have the same problem, that it, there will be a growth narrative which is going to be very different from the reality. And my, my sense is that uh, institutions like the RBI do their own quarter on quarter calculations, so they are okay. But I think the point I'm trying to make is that the getting the growth narrative is imperative. Getting the right growth narrative, without the right growth narrative, you can't get the right policies. And I think we need to go back and start thinking about, you know, what is the way of presenting the right growth narrative? Well, the first thing we have to do before we answer that question, what's the way of correctly presenting the growth narrative is to say to ourselves, at the moment, we are relying upon year on year calculations that are misleading. Yes. They present a untrue but pleasing picture of the economy. We need to change the way we calculate GDP. It may not be therefore so cheering to see it in quarter to quarter terms, but at least it will be truthful. I thank you for having explained this situation. I hope for the audience that it wasn't quite as technical and forbidding as I said at the beginning it might be. <laughs> My feeling is that as the discussion flowed, people will have understood 
the essential point you're making. The critical question is, I hope someone in the government is listening to you. And if they are listening, I hope they also take heed. Thank you very much, Dr. Aziz. Take care. Thank you. Stay safe. You too.